Okay. Well, I think it's around session 65. So it seems, you know, I get, I get lost a little bit. So um, in any event, in, in continuing trying to um, not get too repetitious, uh, I decided to pick a scene from kind of the, one of the quiet back streets of Venice in the rain. So we really don't have sunlight today. So we're not gonna be talking about heavy duty light and shadow, form light, form shadow. We're gonna be talking a little bit about mood, atmosphere, reflections, because I think that's an important part. Um, and possibly a little bit of color enhancement. Um, so with that in mind, uh, I'm gonna put a few marks down. I'll talk a little bit about things. I wanna kind of find out what this line is gonna be. It's about two thirds of the way down. So we're gonna put it right about here. And then this is almost central, which I don't mind at all. And then a little bit, I want a little bit of perspective, not a lot, but there is a little bit of perspective in this. So, uh, you know, that's always a factor. Uh, the corner of the building is gonna be about in here, maybe a little over a little bit, maybe about here. And then there's gonna have this corner. It's a little part of something, I'm not gonna put that in. Um, and I'm gonna, uh, just so you guys know, I'm gonna eliminate a couple things. Uh, this happened to be a morning that uh, I decided to take a walk and take some pictures because it was raining instead of painting. So um, there's a group of chairs. This in the evening is a, uh, an area where there's a lot of chairs and things sitting out so people can sit outside and drink wine and whatever. So I'm gonna get rid of this. and I'm gonna continue this all the way down uh, just because it kind of gets in the way. It doesn't fit with the character of the uh, cool old architecture. So let's divide some of these areas up. So let's use this post as one of our divisions. Let's use the edge of this building, which is divided pretty much in half. So we kind of divide this whole thing in half. And then we've got the angle, a little bit more perspective we have to deal with. Um, we just basically look at that angle. I'm a little off. Doesn't matter because by the time I paint it in, I'm gonna change it anyway. Uh, Wait, it works its way over here. I don't even know if you guys can see some of these marks, they're so light. Um, and I'm doing that on purpose. I want the marks light. I, I just don't wanna have to cover up stuff. Then there's, uh, there's a figure in there, my gosh. I mean, you guys probably noticed it before. Um, and in, yeah, I've already started thinking about it. I'm gonna, I want his umbrella to stand out. He's got a pattern down here, I don't like that. I'm gonna make it more of a yellow umbrella. Um, so what we're gonna do is, we're gonna decide about halfway down, about, about here, I guess, there's a little awning that sticks out. And then the little figure is gonna fit somewhere about in here. You notice I say about in here. You know, until we get, until I get these masses in, I'm not sure. I might, I, I want him in a little bit of a different spot, but this is my first, first thought is that he's gonna be right about in here. He's going to go out, he's going to come down, his legs intersect, and they come down a little bit below this point, so they're about in here. Now, if I were doing a totally finished studio painting, I'd probably spend a lot of time getting the, more of the drawing down, but for the sake of the spontaneity of the effect of location painting, um, I do what we, we might consider a more abbreviated type of drawing. Which, which I've been doing all along. So uh, this is nothing new. And it's just so I can get kind of the placement of things where I think they belong. Straight up, another window, smaller window, same, but the same level. And another window about here, about the same level, so. This one's gonna come over a little. All right, so we've got enough. This is perspective too. It's gonna, doesn't really matter at this point, but I'm gonna kind of get it in there. So it kind of echoes. With that in mind, I'm gonna paint. Don't wanna to take too much time. Uh, painting, it will always take a little bit longer than drawing, uh, linear drawing, I mean. So where to start, you know, where to start? I'm gonna start on the left and work my way to the right. Here's I go in the background. I still am gonna go in the background. I'm not gonna put this guy in until later, but I'm gonna work from here over 
and down. Now, if uh, you were here and you asked me why, I would answer because I feel it's going to work that way. There's not a specific reason. It's just everybody has a way they kind of like to work. Um, and I believe I believe in that wholeheartedly, yet I do believe that you should be able to try it from several different points of view. So first thing I'm going to do is kind of mask this dark shape in. It's not as dark as I want it. About here. I'd rather cover, as I've always said, I'd rather cover too much in the beginning and have to correct than have to not cover enough and at the last minute fill in. So it's a lot easier for me. And a lot of the comments that I make have, have there's relevance to uh, what we might consider finished painting, but a lot of it has to do with the time frame. And the time frame is really geared a little bit more towards what you might consider uh, plain air work, work outside, work location work. Now this would be a, a, a kind of a fun one to try on location. Of course, you got to get the you got to get this guy to stand there and be willing to get wet. But so what I'm doing right now is I'm kind of drawing the shapes. Uh, let's see. Let's find the doorway, which is going to be about I don't know. Let's let's say it's going to be here. And the window is going to be about here. And this window is going to be about here. And the door is going to come all the way down. So we start to get a little bit of a feeling. This is pretty thin paint, so I'm able to almost wash it in, so to speak. It's not, I'm not laying the paint in so thick. Um, once we get this, then we need a little bit of something over here. There's a, a, and there's a doorway. This doorway is going to go all the way down, and that's where. That's where the, the chairs are. All right, so we're going to take it all the way down. And then there's little windows, there's a post. There's a lot of stuff going on. A lot of it's Venice has got a lot of activity in the architecture. It's not, which is why I love it. Um, Alice would like to know about your brushes, brand, and size. Oh, okay. It's the same brand I've used over and over. It's a one inch um, Blick gesso brush. Very, very inexpensive. It's about seven bucks. And I like to use it in the beginning. I don't want my perfect brushes right in the beginning. Uh, and I've stated this too many times, but I don't want to be too perfect in the beginning um, on, a, on a quick painting. Uh, I, I really shouldn't use that terminology. I don't want to be too perfect. Um, I, I don't want to be it goes back to it goes back to what I, a line I use over and over again about um, approach it like you know what you're doing and assume you're wrong. So appro uh, approach any painting with conviction. Don't appro approach a painting with timidity. I think if you're timid, it shows. If you're, if you're bold, even if you're wrong, sometimes it looks really good. So in the beginning, just, pu just put your strokes down. Just trust yourself a little bit. And then after that, you move to your rosemary. Excuse me? Was it after laying and you moved to your rosemary brushes? Yeah. Yeah, when I, when I want quality of refinement, then I, I switch over to rosemary brushes, which is our, and I generally work with the, uh, the, the bristles. Uh, although I am doing a couple of portrait pieces right now, and I, am, I work very often when I do those, I'll work with the, uh, the synthetic mongoose. So it really, you know, it depends. I like, I love paint brushes. Uh, and I, I actually have kind of fallen in love with a lot of the rosemary brushes uh, for, for refined work. But you see, see me work with this brush a lot because this is all lay and work. So you said synthetic mongoose and what else? And bristle. It's the kind of the ivory. It's not always just the ivory. They have several different types of bristles. I kind of like all of them. I experiment a lot. I mess around, try different brushes. Sometimes I get into a rut, feel like I'm in a rut and I switch. You know, make it fun for yourself, make it interesting and make it, 
I, for lack of a better word, a little bit adventurous. You know, don't don't feel like you have to. Uh, I, I let, let me give a little art philosophy here. Okay, I think in order to improve, you've got to stay with a a pr approach or process that works and build on that process. And once you once you start to establish confidence where everything is beginning to work, then you can take some chances, try some different types of things. But initially, it's really beneficial to stay true to, to uh, yourself and be, don't be too advent adventurous in the beginning. Uh, and there's a, there's a couple of variables there. If you're the kind of artist that wants to be totally exploratory, I think that's great, but I think no matter how exploratory you're going to base that on knowledge and process that you've picked up along the way. So, see, a lot, I've got a lot of junk in the brush. And what that's doing is that that's adding to what we would refer to as the patina of the building, the character, the history. Because these buildings, you know, these buildings aren't neat and clean. And that's what makes them beautiful. So well, I want to get enough tone in here. So I basically, and I'm working on kind of a, you can see that's the canvas, that's my flesh tone. So it's a similar value of, of flesh tone. It's a little darker than I, I often work on, but whatever. It's I switch that off. I don't have a I don't have a formula that I use for an underpainting. I try different types of underpaintings. Uh, often I find from a teaching point of view, it's better to keep people a little bit more on the neutral side. Just because people can fall in love with color to the point where they kind of destroy the, uh, the believability of a situation. And, you know, it's, it's not unusual. It's one of those things that everybody uh, experiences. You fall in love with a, a, a color, a color scheme, um, and you begin to. And that's, I, to a degree, it's how people's styles emerge. They fall in love with a, a an approach, and it becomes their magic formula as to how they kind of approach painting. And we can go back. And we can talk about. It you know, Gustav Klimt or any of these wonderful artists who, who had their own kind of formula, but they also did a little bit of experimentation. So they didn't stay, you don't stay in a rut. And I think that's why I think to a degree, every artist needs a little bit of time where they can just kind of mess around a little bit and try things and not worry about whether it comes out good. I mean, I'm doing that to a degree, but at the same time, I don't want to totally embarrass myself and have it turn out like crap. I want it to actually, you know, and, and believe me, I've done those. And, uh, but the whole idea here is to show everybody how to actually produce a painting that is relatively nice. Believable, so to speak. Just kind of scraping just scraping some tones as yeah, because what happens over history is it you get drips and the drips stain the building so we're creating some of that that uh, ambiance some of that patina now we got a little bit of a red characteristic there so i'm going to use a burnt sienna because i don't need a bright red it's obviously but in burnt sienna by itself can look really bright you see that so probably going to tone that burnt sienna down with just a touch of an ultramarine a little bit of white thrown into it and first, let's get it up in here. And I don't think I'm dark enough, truthfully. So I, whoop, I threw a little bit of, a, of the asphalt in it. And I was mentioning to an art group yesterday, I said, uh, uh, the two tones I use for my dark browns are either burnt umber or asphalt. And then I've kind of fallen into this asphalt deal lately, just because it's a little bit of a darker tone. And 
because it's darker, I can get a little bit different characteristics out. <laughs> Whoa. Sorry. <laughs> that wasn't me that sneezed for a change. It was Anna. Um, one of the other reasons I picked this is where I'm going to be there. We're gonna, I'm doing a workshop there. And uh, I'm not trying to advertise it here, uh, but we do have two spots left. Uh, but we're going to be there and in August. And occasionally you can actually get a little rain in August, but generally it's pretty darn hot. And usually when it rains there in, in those kind of months, it doesn't rain for the, there'll be a, like I remember this day very clearly. It was a downpour in the morning. It cleared up beautifully. This was probably about six, no, maybe six to seven in the mornings before I, uh, the hotel I was staying at had breakfast. And I thought, I want to get out there while it's raining and see if I can get some interesting, because, you know, I've been to Venice many times. I don't get a lot of rain pictures. So it was really kind of nice to be able to get a little, uh, something different. Um, Gail, I'd like to know if you would talk about your journey in establishing your process and how it's evolved over the years. Yeah, let me, I could do that off the top of my head now. You're making me think. <laughs> uh, yeah, so my journey. So I was born in San Francisco. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, I literally uh, went through art school. And I could draw pretty good when I went to art school. I'd done a lot of drawing, all figurative. All I'd ever done was portraits and uh, almost all portraiture type drawing. I was about 19, went to art school, fought like crazy to learn how to paint. It didn't come easy. I wish it did, but it didn't. Um, the drawing part came okay, but the painting part sure took its time. And we painted in art school a little bit of everything, not just oil, in fact, very seldom oil. Uh, most of my training was in acrylic or gouache, a little bit of watercolor and a little bit of oil. So I get out of school and I, uh, in 1970, and I embark upon an illustration career because I was afraid to try and apply an art career. I didn't know, how, I didn't know what I was gonna do uh, to make a living as a fine artist, but I knew illustrators you know, made a decent living. And so I kind of pushed my way into in the illustration market with my uh, figurative work, getting album covers, doing um, things of that nature. Almost all acrylics. Uh, I always wanted to dabble in oils. I, I, one thing I, I, that influenced my journey a lot is going to museums, going to, to Europe and seeing uh, beautiful paintings. You know, I still loved wonderful, exciting illustrations. Some illustrators were extremely graphic and had their own uh, unique styles. Uh, I never had a style as a, as I don't think as a, an illustrator. I was a a guy that painted what clients needed, and um, uh, in pretty much pretty much some form of realism. But you know, during during that time, it was relatively loose, uh, and then it got to where people wanted real tight stuff, and uh, I started working more in oils, and so. All during this whole time, I was painting, painting for myself, trying to learn how to be a better painter, better artist, uh, while while earning my income as an illustrator. And in the late '80s, I made the daring move to pretty much try and curtail most of the illustration projects that came in, uh, which I did. And uh, financially, it was a nice hit. <laughs> what you're used to these really cool projects that pay pretty well. Um, and when I started painting, I had to kind of a, get out of the illustration thinking. Um, at the time, uh, when you work for art directors and clients, you're working for people who want things done a certain way. Generally, uh, they, they control you. And I'm sure any illustrators listening right now will uh, understand exactly what I mean. They, I, I don't wanna say they control you. Uh, that sounds terrible. Um, they, they want their piece that they're hiring for to have a certain look. Hopefully it's the look that you've shown them in your portfolio. But if you're like me, I've had several looks 
so I haven't had a clean one clean look. Um, and eventually, as I moved into painting, it took me a long time to decide what kind of painter I wanted to be. Now, that decision was really influenced very much by several wonderful artists, none of which that are living, uh, with maybe the exception of one, and that would be Bert, Bert Silverman, would be about the only guy at the time that I looked at and said, yep, that's, and it was pri primarily because he was figurative. Um, and I really had considered landscape because I was all, I was teaching workshops, teaching figurative workshops and so. Um, and so I started messing around with landscapes at some of the workshops and uh, really realized it's as much fun as figurative work, you know? And so uh, got involved in doing more landscapes. Uh, the, the artists, I mentioned artists that influenced me. I should mention, I got, I got to give credit to those guys, the greats, the, the ones that a lot of the traditional painters admire, still admire to this day, John Singer Sargent, Joaquin Soroya, Anders Zorn are the big three. Then I discovered uh, Giacomo Favoretto, uh, who I fell in love with. I always liked Villard. Um, you know, there were many different artists for different reasons that I happened to love. I loved Klimt, even though I, that isn't how I wanted to work. I loved his, his boldness and his daringness and his design sensibilities. So I think uh, a good friend of mine once said to him, to steal from one is plagiarism, to steal from many is research. And I think that's what I've done. I've stole from many. We've, we've all been influenced by, and then some dynamite contemporary artists have come along and you know done beautiful work. I, I think of guys like Michael Workman, um, oh, Wayne Tebow, uh, and people, I mentioned him and people go, well, you don't work like Wayne Tebow. Of course I don't. Um, I don't want to because he has such a distinctive style that if I did, everyone would say, oh, Wayne Tebow. Uh, so all that's been, and then you got to get good at it. These are the influences, okay? That's cool. It's great to have influences. Nikolai Fetchin, huge influence. Become more of an influence late, later in the last few years than even in the beginning. Um, so with all of these great influences i emulate them and i used to i looked at their work constantly i looked at photos of it i looked at it in magazines i looked at it whenever i get a chance to see an original uh whether it was in in europe or whether it was a show here i i would go and i look at the paintings and i go up close remember it i remember a show i went to in the 70s with uh, john asaro and you know, I, I've told the story hundreds of times, and uh, it was an American Impression show. It was part of the show, the first show that I went immediately, I, I got to paint. And I remember uh, John going home after we saw this wonderful American Impression show. And a lot of artists I'd never heard of, uh, William Paxton, and uh, a lot of these in, incredible, you know, the Edgar Paynes. Uh, and John said to me, we were having, we went out and had some breakfast afterwards. And he said to me, uh, boats and kids on the beach. That's what I got out of this. And I thought, great. I got to go home and finish a movie poster. You know, it's like, and that had a big influence on me. That had a big influence on me knowing that I really wanted to to paint and look at these guys and figure out how to, you know, the other thing that was important to me is I, having a family, you got to figure out now, can I make a living doing this? So all of these, all that stuff came together. Not any one thing, it all influenced me. Um, I don't think it influenced my style, my approach, as much as it influenced uh, my thinking in terms of, it, not in terms of how to paint. It might have influenced me in terms of what to paint. I can't say that for sure. I think it did. Um, but it's one of those things that your journey is, and I've tried to get better. That's the other thing. 
you just try every painting. I, I always wanted my next painting to be better than that one. Didn't always happen, still doesn't. But uh, it's one of these things. And I tried different subject matters. Part of my journey is different subject matters, really. I mean, I think that, that, that part, it, I probably don't talk about enough. Uh, when I first started painting, it was all figurative. And I remember going to several galleries and they said, well, you know, really have a hard time selling figures. And I went, well, you know, I made my living illustrating. I got to figure out a way to make a living. So, so I started doing figures from behind. <laughs> so people didn't know who they were. And it's fun. That, that afforded me something that I'd never really gotten into. And that was folds, folds and clothing. Um, everything has its own possibilities. You know, you can really delve into it. So I kind of really got into the aspect of doing figurative work uh, with folds. And as I was doing this, um, I had to put those figures somewhere. You know, I, I didn't want to just put them against the gray background, black background. I wanted to put them in an environment. Uh, and so that got me into landscapes, you know, painting a figure outdoors, getting into landscapes. All of a sudden I discovered landscapes and I went, hey, this is kind of neat. I want to do more of this. And so it, it's, it's a process uh, of exploration and growth, I would say over the course of several years. And what happens is the more you paint, the more you come up with little things that work for you and you hang on to those in the back of your head at all times. And you use those whenever you're painting. So one of the things that I have found, I remember having discussions with uh, Dan Cooper, who's a very wonderful artist, who's a good friend. We used to hang out and have these philosophical discussions about art. And one of, the, one of our discussions had to do with getting yourself in trouble in a painting and painting your way out of it. And I think that's one of the ways you learn. Uh, if you're if you're so timid that you approach every painting, every painting identical to the last painting, then you don't. But if you figure out a way to get yourself in trouble and get then get out of it, then you've learned something. Uh, paint yourself into a corner and paint your way out. Another way of putting it. Okay, so all that contributed. All of that contributed. Uh, now, I, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't really uh, bring up the teaching side because uh, that had a lot to do with, with me too. That had a lot to do with what I'm doing right now, demonstrating, painting live in front of people. Um, and, and I've done this for my gosh, a long time. <laughs> I've, I've literally since 1970, I, I think taught my first class in 1974, and I've never taken a semester off uh, from teaching. From, uh, and I taught primarily at a you know, college level. And then along with that, I did workshops. And between all of that, you learn something too, because you, you do very often when you demonstrate, paint yourself into a corner, <laughs> you get yourself in trouble. And figure out so that you don't make a fool of yourself, which is kind of what I'm doing. I don't, I'm not saying I'm making a fool of myself, but you know, some of the some of the things I even attempt to this day um, in front of a group, I question the intelligence of trying that. <laughs> uh, you know, should I have tried that? I mean, I've tried things. I, I have this one I've been wanting to try. I've been wanting to do one of these really big, like 30 by 40 or even even bigger um, in, in this time frame. <laughs> Partly to see if I can do it. Um, I mean, I know I can do it. I don't know if I can do it well. <laughs> That's the key. I feel confident I can do almost anything, okay? If that sounds too uh, bold, that confidence is there. The question is, can I do it well? <laughs> that I can't guarantee. But it's nice to try. If I fail, you know what? That's all that means. That means the next time, hopefully I'll do it better. So 
And I think that's the approach you've got to take as a painter. You cannot, you cannot assume, and I read up, I think I, I've talked about this in past uh, demos, whether it's been here or in person or anything like that. But uh, I read a book by uh, Andrew Loomis, who was an illustrator called the Creative Creative Illustration, I think it's called, I can't remember. Um, he was also a great painter. So let's not, and the, which is true with most illustrators, they're not just illustrators, my gosh, uh, they're great artists. So, but he wrote in one of his uh, things, he says, every time you sit down to work, you can't be a genius. And my God, I love that because that is, I, I, I can't say how true that is. It's just, it's exactly right. You just, there's just no way every time you sit down to do something, it's gonna come out great. You know, hopefully, and I, I tell this to uh, illustration and painting students both, hopefully they all come out good. And every now and then, one's really gonna come out good. And that's what keeps you going. That kind of gets your juices up and makes you wanna work harder is those ones that come out just a little bit better than all the others. And then you go, okay, I, now it's, it's like a drug. It's like, it's like getting a high and go and trying to find it again. So I probably got off the track there, I'm sorry. Um, but a journey is a journey. You know, you know who said that? I don't know that anybody ever did. I think I just did. The journey, it's just, it's, it's what we all go through. Everyone, every artist, I love to get together with friends that are artists and have them tell me their journeys. You know, a few of them that I, I don't know well that I'd like to get to know better um, comes to mind. I'd love to sit down and spend a couple days with uh, Jim McVicker, who is a great plain air painter, uh, Ned, Ned Mueller. I spent a, a lot of, uh, I spent enough time with some of my friends that are fabulous artists and I enjoy, I, I love talking to uh, my friend Kathleen Dunphy. Um, but we end up kind of, end up talking about other things about, besides art, like music and <laughs> the old days and some of my old illustrator friends that I really haven't had a chance to see in a long time, Bob Rodriguez, uh, you know, people like that, that have been, I'm fortunate that I, in, in the world of teaching that I've kept in touch with some uh, dynamite artists, Chuck File comes to mind. Um, and, you know, it's just wonderful to have a, a relationship you, because we've been through the same, you know, you talk to these illustrators, even the young illustrators, Ray Bonilla, Ray Zellin half the time watching me. Fabulous, fabulous young illustrator. Um, and they, they're going through everything that I went through probably, Chuck went through, all these guys. Young painters coming along, uh, you know, and I, I must admit, uh, being a teacher makes you work harder. You see these young guys coming along, you know, Xin Yao Zeng, you know, I watched him and I went, I better work a little harder, man. This kid, this kid is phenomenal. So keeps you on your toes, keeps you humble too. You realize that these people have the, have the same passion that you had many, many years ago and are working every bit as hard, if not harder. God, I, heart, I have a hard time believing they're working harder, but some of them may. Really, I mean, I, it, it is really hard, dedicated work to become a really good artist. I mean, if you're, I don't know if anybody's fortunate enough to just be naturally great. I don't know, every artist I know, who's this young kid, Kyle Ma? Kid's like 20, 20 years old. 
it's doing work that is way beyond my capacity when I was 40 years old. So, you know, it's, uh, I don't know, it's, it's inspiring. And it's also, it's definitely not, um, it, it, it definitely doesn't bring you down. It doesn't bring me down. It, it inspires me and makes me want to work harder. What brush are you using? I am using a rosemary filbert, a number eight. And I'm just bringing, I should be, I shouldn't be doing, I'm glad you asked me that question. I shouldn't be doing what I'm doing. I was, I was fussing around too much. Too early to fuss. Where am I at here time-wise? Oh, okay. Just a little over 30 minutes into it. Um, I don't know what else to tell you about a journey. Um, I, I know I got off the track as I often do. Just be thankful you're not in one of my classes because I really get off the track. And... <laughs> you know, and I, I, should, I, I should bring up painting animals. I still love it. I almost did one today. Came really close, almost did. And it's something I, I discovered because there was a, a organization called Arts for the Parks. Oh, and it was very popular back, I don't know, I, somebody told me, but I forget who, and everybody said, oh, you gotta do Arts for Parks. That's, that's about, that's, I think I've got that in the right spot. Um, so I looked it up and I think I entered one year, I did a painting of a, oh, what was it, Point Reyes, because it was the nearest park. And so, I, I, it got in and you know I felt really good it felt like I somebody recognized that I was doing decent work um and we went and I went to the show and some of the work was just great some of the work was and eh, in my opinion but that's just my opinion okay for whatever that's worth um but one of the things that I discovered there were moose <laughs> Because we were right there in Jackson, Wyoming, and there was all these cool moose got in, sold. Every time I paint a moose, it would sell. Beautiful, dark animals. Just the kind that you go, man, I got to paint. It's just incredible. So I got into painting those things and loved it. And then uh, Arts for Parks kind of diminished. And the only place I could ever sell was in the Rocky Mountain states, things like moose. And so I kind of abandoned it. I still like painting them. To this day, I love painting moose. Um, I almost painted one today, like I said. Uh, but that taught me other things. I mean, that taught me you know, the anatomy and structure of animals and how to create the illusion of different types of fur. And so I think every time you attempt something new, you learn from that. Whether you pull it off really well or whether you don't, you learn from that. And I think, you know, that's what, hopefully painting is a constant way to, to keep learning. That's a little too warm. So as I'm uh, telling you all of this, I'm going along just kind of on autopilot here. Um, Are you still sort of blocking things on? Yeah, it's still it's still a, a form of blocking is what I'm doing here. I'm not, if I, I know I can go back and refine quickly if I have to at the end. Uh, so I'm leaving things alone uh, that probably, do need more work in them, but I'm not doing more work because of time. If I don't keep moving, that's the old illustrator in me. If I don't keep moving, uh, I'm going to end up with this looking really nice, and you guys are going to love it, and all this is going to look like junk. And I'd rather have it all look pretty good than one one area look great, and the other area look just totally awful. So we want to. I want the whole painting. Whoops, that's way too light. I want the whole painting 
to work as a whole, not as individual parts. All right, so let's take that tone right there. Bring it up here, down, around his arm. I probably moved some things around. You can call that artistic license or laziness. One of the uh, both are true. We all write things off to artistic license. Oh, well, I want you know it's it's like teaching for all these years, and I was said I, I would love to write a book on students' comebacks, excuses, if you will. It's like, well, I wanted it to be this way. Yeah, but your perspective's wrong. Well, yeah, but I wanted to distort. Well, it's got to look intentional like you're distorting. So it's, you know, if there's nothing wrong, all there's so many wonderful styles and there's room for every style. If you're if you're an artist that likes painting super tight, there's there's room for you. If you're an artist that, that likes painting almost abstract, there's room for you. There's places. Perfect, perfect that approach. Get it down to where it is you. And when people look at it, they go, oh, that's, that's definitely so-and-so. So Laurel has an interesting question. I'm wondering how you find new approaches, especially if you've been painting for decades, so you keep your edge. Like you just said, maybe different subject yes. matter techniques. Subject matter, is, subject matters will do it. Uh, techniques will do it. Starting one way, sometimes I'll start with the don't draw, and I'll just start with blocking in. Um, color schemes i you know it's fun to come up with wow that's a neat color you know that's but you come up with so everything is exciting uh, once you once you get to the point where you can start producing decent paintings and i don't even mean great i mean decent paintings um where you don't embarrass yourself it may not be exactly as good as you want it to be but you're not you don't feel terrible about it let's put it that way um So I'm doing some of the technical patinas in these buildings, but that's, I, I mean, to, to answer, I think it's a great question. I think it's a question all artists needs, all artists blah, 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 need to ask themselves constantly. How do I, you know, and changing pace. I make people, uh, it's some, in my workshops in Europe very often, if anybody's out there that has been to them, you know, we, we usually spend a day, um, doing what I call quick studies. I remember I was doing a demonstration yesterday at Wendy Brayton studio and I brought up the fact that uh, yeah. one of the things that we'll do is we'll get up in the morning and I say, okay, by four, you're gonna have six paintings and we're gonna take a look at them. And one of the individuals went, I mean, almost came out of a seat. Um, it sounds, it sounds impossible if you haven't done it. But you know what? You can do it. You can do it. The other thing, uh, something that I just discovered a few years ago is, is painting large on location. You know what? I didn't know I could do it. So I had to go out and try it a few times to see if I could do it. And once I figured out kind of, I don't want to say a formula, but a system of being able to pull a large painting off in a relatively short period of time, then I said, okay, let's try this as far as a workshop and let's see how other people do at it. And so uh, that's it. I, I found one of the most enjoyable things for me is doing something that I coined this phrase. I, I coined this phrase because of the class and it's quick studies. And so I was developing a class when I was teaching at Art Center and I didn't know I was part of a class. And when I finally came to the Academy of Art in San Francisco, I developed this into a full, you know, 15 week semester class. But I didn't have a title for it. So basically, you're doing studies, you're not doing finished paintings in, in 40 minutes. And um, so I call it quick studies. And it caught on. A lot of people use that phrase now quick studies. Uh, I don't want to say I'm the inventor of it, but I had never heard of it before. Other people may have used it. I just had never heard of it. And um, 
It's fun. You may hate it. You were generally, when people first try it, they're frustrated. And after a while, pretty much what I say, here's the deal, guys. I'm giving you permission to do bad paintings. They, they're not going to come out great. They, but you will learn things. You, you know, a lot of the brushwork, people go, where'd you learn your brushwork? And people, how'd you learn how to paint fast? Well, I didn't. I learned because I remember being in class one time and a teacher of mine, who was probably the most influ influential teacher that I ever had was Don Putman. And he, I remember him bringing in a 24 by 30 painting of his kids. I know, very loose. And Putt used to paint relatively tight, just so you know. Uh, and he brought it in. That was cool. It was neat. It was really kind of brushy, really more unfinished than most of his pieces. But, you know, we were all oogling over it. And he did it in an hour. And I went, wow, just, you know, it just blew me away. And that probably more than anything else influenced my concept of doing quicker paintings. Of, I, don't think, I don't know if Anna ever heard that story. Um, did you? Uh, and it was really, that is probably the first inclination I had of, of and I, you know, well, why'd you do that? Why'd you do that? And his answer was to see if I could do it. <laughs> Perfect answer. See if you can do it. It doesn't come out, it doesn't come out. You know, it came out good enough where he didn't feel embarrassed to show us. Was it one of his best? No, but it was neat. And you start to learn that you start to appreciate things more. Because a lot of times um, artists will literally think that when you do quicker paint, I mean, when you do any sort of realistic painting, you're just kind of a wrist and you just kind of go through the motions and you don't, by God. But when you have to work quickly, right, you, you build intuitive aspects to your painting approach. And that's one way to do it. If you give yourself... If you go through this long, treacherous, then you paint, which is great. There are artists that do that and they love, if you like what you're doing, don't change. If you don't like what you're doing, you get a little bored, try some other things. Laurel wants to know how big the quick cities are. When how big? Do, yeah, when you're doing- well, Generally, when I do them in, Cl or on, when, in Europe. Europe, I tell them we have to do four. I usually have them do a five by seven or six by eight. Eight by 10 is about the largest. But they have to have six of them. Then another exercise I came up with a few years ago, thanks to one of my students, she came up. She said, "Are there any things you can do that force us to really think out of the box as we're painting?" And I went, "Yep, it's an idea I had had for a long time. It's something I had tried on my own." Um, so I give out. A series, that's really bad. I give out a series of black and white photos in class, all right? I, and I basically take about 50 of them and lay them out, let people choose. They have to choose, they basically have got to choose one. Once they've chosen that one, they have to do a painting of that in four different forms. It can be a seasonal difference. It can be a night painting, a day painting, an autumn painting, a snowy painting. It can be a uh, painting that is rain, a painting that is very foggy. But you have to use that black and white as your reference. And it's the same image. And I usually, I make them do four of them in a day. Now, what do I mean by a day? Um, I usually do a demo right off the bat, take one and do a night scene or something just so they can kind of see the overall approach. And after that, they have usually from about 9.30 till oh, about uh, 2.30 to get four paintings done. Uh, Mitchell said he just about painted in your quick study class when you said <clears throat> that 
they would have about 75 paintings at the end of the semester. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, I remember, Mitchell. Yeah, you're absolutely right. That's generally, I say, I think I added it up. It's between 72 to 80 paintings by the end of the semester. It's not, and, you know, calling them paintings is probably unfair. They're studies. But within those studies, you learn a lot. And I, that's the key in that is to learn. Now, and then along with, I also give 24 homeworks. And they're all studies. And I'll tell you what, I've had a couple of students, um, and I remember them vividly. In fact, one of them every now and then tunes into this, uh, that, that when they did their homeworks, they did these wonderful little eight by 10 paintings and then sold them all. Uh, blew me away that someone is that like, thinking that advanced. I never thought like that. But, and Mina, if you're listening, Mina Ho. <laughs> Andrea Wicklin was the other one, and she became a wonderful illustrator. John wants to know how thick, how thick your paint is at this stage. Right now, it's getting a little thicker. Initially, in those first lay-ins, it was kind of thin. It's getting, it's getting thicker. And that's what I, the way that I paint generally anyway. I start relatively thin, and I apply. But now, to answer answer this, I need to answer it a couple of ways because somebody asked the question earlier about what keeps you. Sometimes I've approached paintings where I just start super thick. It's th I call them thick and gooey. Maybe I'll do one. I've never done a big one, thick and gooey, <laughs> never. So maybe, uh, you know, but I will apologize before I start in case I really blow it. I never know how these are going to come out. Just, I usually figure they're going to come out okay. And usually they do. And I might have put myself into a corner today, it looks like. I've got about 40 minutes maybe left. And I haven't even gotten into some of the other areas. Got to get enough of this laid in so that I can make, the, I can make it work. If I don't get it laid in right. I don't care what I do as far as a refinement goes, it's not going to work. Now, I want to give credit to a different way of thinking, a good, good, good friend that I went to art school with, who is just a phenomenal artist. And I mean, this guy does some of the most ambitious work, and I mean that, uh, and he, he'll take a long time. So he's not, he's not gonna do stuff like this. Um, that's Jim Dietz, James Dietz. You guys have not had the opportunity to look at his work uh, and, be totally blown away by it, by just the ambition with this, what he attempts, sometimes 40 figures in a painting. They're all generally uh, historically based, uh, military type of paintings and incredible, just incredible. So Jim, you're probably not listening, but you're probably painting. Jim's either painting or traveling, if I know Jim. Okay, so we're getting the patina down. We got to move on to some areas because we're running up. Um, so let's let's start to get like all that little crap. And hopefully, I'll get that in. We we'll get a little bit of a top of that, but I got to get some of this ground plane in. Then we're going to get the figures is primarily a silhouette. So if you're wondering, well, when's it going to get to the figure? Well, you know, my answer is later because it's pretty much just the silhouette. So I don't have, as long as I get the proportions right, he's not gonna take a lot of time for, for this particular um, style of painting. I do need, however, to get kind of enough of the characters, all kinds of stuff going on in this ground. And for, for this, I'm gonna use my paint a little thinner just because I need to cover a lot of territory. You know, I see a, a little, almost like, I guess you call it a porch, right about there. And I think I could probably put one right there. Because gonna, we're gonna put, some of this I'm just, is almost becoming abstract. I don't care, that doesn't bother me. If it feels good, I don't, in fact, that's great. 
a little bit of color. Okay, now we start to lose the color as it moves down. So I added some blue to that. And we're blue, maybe a little bit of alizarin, because I see a little bit of warmth down in here. Not enough, a little bit. Let's try that red. Yeah, let's try that. A little bit on this side, nowhere near as dark. So I've got to get these overall tones in. I'll get some striations in at the very end, probably within about the last three or four minutes. You know, I mentioned to a group yesterday, one of the things that I, I actually do in, is I try not to stay with the same color in my brush too long. I'm constantly remixing. If I see it change a little bit, then I, I change. So I'm, I'm reacting. Now, and sometimes you're right, sometimes you're wrong. That's what makes a painting another photograph. Another one, huh? Excuse me. <laughs> That's terrible. You know, when your wife becomes allergic to you. <laughs> Lots of stuff in the air. Huh? Lots of stuff in the air. Yeah. Okay. I think, but if somebody asked a question a little bit ago, and I could be wrong with this, but I think they actually, the workshop group that I end up taking whenever we go to Europe, actually end up enjoying that little day's challenge. Of course, the reason that is part, partly is because at the end of it, we usually crack open a good a bottle of wine. Or a few. Or two. I remember, uh, being in Elba, the island of Elba, which is one of our favorite places. Uh, and I remember uh, Brian Blood was, and Lori were there. And I was, I decided I was gonna go up kind of high at our, at our villa that we were at, and start painting. And I remember Brian yelling at me, asking me to hold still. And I was shocked because Brian generally doesn't paint figures, but he wanted, he wanted. <laughs> Did he paint you? Yeah, remember. yeah. He, he, he said he posted it recently. Aww, I and he was getting back at me because I painted a portrait of him and gave it to Laurie once. <laughs> but but I, I think the people actually enjoy, end up enjoying it. You know, everyone moans and groans when I first give it, which is a kind of, and that's what I, what I enjoy, knowing that, oh, it's like in class. And Mitchell, you were there. So uh, being in class and using this line, it's five minutes left and hearing half the class just moan. It's like a stomach ache just thinking. Yeah. You got five minutes, got two minutes left. Oh. It's exhausting. Yeah, I must admit, that's exhausting for me too. You, you do come out of, you, and M Mitchell's on, he's on all the time. So but Mitchell would probably go along with this. You come out of it and you're pretty exhausted at the end of it. You don't, I mean, it's not one of these things that you go, okay, now I'll go play, a, now I'll go play soccer. Yeah. yeah. It's more like, okay, well, now, now I'll take a nap. But once again, guys, that's how we all learn. Push ourselves, try things. Now, when you, if you've got to do a painting and you know it's got to come out good, Go back to your tried and true. And then what, what's gonna happen from that tried and true? And this kind of goes along with this journey concept that was asked earlier. When you go along with that tried and true, um, you add to it. You add little, you pick up little things along the way. Hey, this worked, I'm gonna do a little bit of this. Oh, you know, and I, you know, something like, well, you know, I found if I added a little bit more ultramarine, I can really make that thing, I, I, you know, pop more. So. Feel, feel emboldened. Speaking of that, let's get more on the skin here as quick as we can, okay? Because I'm, I'm spending a lot of time telling you stuff that uh, is probably important, but.
and I do, I, I generally do talk a lot when I demonstrate. Um, <laughs> I told the group yesterday, there's a reason for that. It's because I'm paranoid that if I don't talk, you're probably making fun of me. And so um, I keep talking. <clears throat> don't give you guys a chance. So if Gail would like to know, after all these years, how did you settle on your primary palette? My primary palette? <laughs> um, let me think. Well, I always you know, need white. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so let's start with that. Uh, I found I loved Na Naples yellow. It's a color I was able to use in almost any form of painting. Yellow ochre, the same thing. It was is a color that just worked uh, whenever I wanted it to. Now the reds, I'm st I'm still out on that. You know, I'm not necessarily 100% uh, positive on any one red. Uh, it's primarily I don't use a lot of reds, um, but I always put I always have a lizard crimson uh, because it's such a dark, deep, warm color, and I know that I can take a lizard and crimson and I can mix it into blacks and warm that black up. So there's a, there's a reason for that color. Ultramarine blue, the same thing. I always have ultramarine blue on my palette because it's the darkest, coolest color that there is. Now, let's go, let's talk about greens. Um, I've gone through a whole, I used to use Viridian. Viridian, I just, for me, is too powerful. I'd rather have a duller color. If I need to make it more powerful, I can always add Viridian. So, I came up with sap green a long time ago, and it it really stemmed from being an illustrator and using a green called Hooker's Green. Um, okay, so, so we're coming up with these striations, and I'll pull these this way at the very end. Um, let me let me keep going, and then the umber I, I've always used burnt umber, and it was just honest to God a few years ago that I really discovered asphaltum. Um, and which is to me a darker umber. And so that's it. Now other colors, in this case, I have burnt sienna or, and I don't, I won't say I use that all the time, I don't. Uh, it's a great color to mix flesh tones with. And if you don't wanna to get too hot, if you don't wanna to get too red, it's a nice warm. It keeps you from getting too, too uh, intense with your reds. Um, along with that, Occasionally, I add this light blue, which I've added more recently. Um, it's a nice, light, cool color. I'm just lazy. That's all. That's all. The only reason you use a color like that is you're lazy. Uh, and I can be as lazy as anybody. In other words, you can mix that color. You could, you could just go with the whatever. A lot of it came from school, what teachers taught me. S some of it came from illustrating finding and learning what worked, and then from painting, and then from other artists, you know, other artists. Uh, I learned as much from students as they learned from me. Uh, we were in, um, where were we? No, we were in uh, Montepulciano. It's fun to say, isn't it? Uh, and I was painting a building. I, never, I told the story yesterday. I was, I was painting a building, and it was really kind of a, I was in the shade and it was a lot of light on the building. And um, I couldn't get, I was trying to put, I had painted all the darks, was coming in and trying to really put some beautiful warm lights on it. Couldn't get it to work. I was God, it was just driving me crazy. And uh, one of the people taking the workshop, Cynthia Hamilton came up behind me and handed me, and she's, she's a treasure trove of knowledge with new types of supplies. Uh, she, she's, Constant. Have you tried this? Have you tried that? Well, she came up behind me and she added something to my palette called solvent-free gel. And by God, it worked. I was able to paint this building. I put the lights on. And ever since then, I've been a huge proponent of it. Also, uh, I don't use liquid. Now, Windsor Newton would probably want to ban me from their site but telling you this, but uh, I've had too many friends get really sick using liquid. And so I quit using liquid, oh my God, 
15 years ago. I don't think I've used Wick one since. Um, and yet I know people that use it and it works just fine. <laughs> so, you know, it's, but I, I have a couple friends that have gotten really deathly ill. One of them uh, switched to acrylic painting because it, it really ruined the use of oils for him. Uh, Could have also been solvent. And so. yeah, and um, another one, a uh, young lady used to take a workshop from me and all the time uh, got, I mean, literally she was being diagnosed for deathly, deadly illnesses. And, and it, was, it was liquid related and oil related, but it was more liquid. Uh, and then recently I've had a couple of, of students that graduated that have had issues with it. So I literally, I don't use it. Yet I do know people that use it, use it fine. I never have any problems. So it really comes down to what you make work for you. But I fell in love with solvent free gel. And uh, I recently tried, um, some of you guys probably already know, but I'm a proponent of, of uh, safflower oil. Nothing wrong with linseed oil, nothing wrong with walnut oil. I use them both, um, have them both, but I don't know why. I just gravitated towards safflower. And that came from Windsor, from the Windsor Newton, the chemist that came to school one time and gave a lecture on solvents. And, and they said the best, the purest form was um, that would not yellow your colors for permanence and all this was safflower oil. So, I started using it. I went, hey, this is pretty neat. So anyway, we're gonna get this. I gotta get the silhouette in here. So if I can leave some of the stuff really underdone if I need to, but I can't leave him. He's he's important. So we want the bottom of the umbrella about there. That means his arm is gonna be about here. Come down. And I'm using my rosemary now because it's important. You know, as soon as I get into things that really are important, but if like portraits, I use these brushes because they're much, much more of a refined brush. Which one is that? And this is the Rosemary Filbert number eight. And it's a uh, hog's bristle. It's got a beautiful long spring to it. I, I don't like brights. Uh, once again, I've got a couple friends that are wonderful painters. So I, every time I Say, I don't, I want you to be aware that I don't. That doesn't mean other people don't. I don't like brights. Yet I do know two or three hours that that's their, their brush of choice to go to. So everyone will develop their own feel for what is good and what is not good. What you like, what you don't like. And I learned that a long time. I thought there was, I thought there were rules. You had, you always had to do this. You always had to do that. And you know, then I used to hear the line: "Rules are meant to be broken." Man, is that true? Yeah. So everything I'm telling you, you can find somebody who doesn't do it, who does fabulous work. And I've come up with. I was, and I tell students this, what I, I always demonstrate, maybe I should take, do some demonstrations where I just cut loose and try some crap. Uh, but I always tell people, I try and teach the easiest way. Then you can make it more difficult on you at any time. Learn a good solid approach, learn a good solid approach, and then do offshoots. And a good solid approach, meaning something you know you can produce relatively consistently well. Once you have that down, try whatever the heck you want. And if you don't want to do it in front of anybody, don't. Just do it because you want to do it. Okay, let's, oh, you know what? This extends all the way out. I, I kind of don't like that. I'm not going to do that. Let's, I wanted to make this, this umbrella a little bit more yellow. So we're gonna do a few little touches in here. And I can see that I'm gonna need to have 
a few more things in here. Got about a little over 20 minutes. That's really not enough time, but it's enough time to make uh, it appear complete. Okay, let's go to the umbrella now. I'll, yellow is my color choice, and I'm going to start with a um, ochre and white. Let's see what the hell this does, huh? What do you say? See, I want the punch. The, my wrist freezing yellow is I want it to harmonize the, all these colors. Every, every color up here has got yellow in it. And like a little duller as it moves over. Take it over and put that one more time. There we go. Now let's bring it down. I'm letting other colors mix into it a little bit. You know, I've done paintings where I've changed umbrella colors in the past, and then I've gone back and changed it again and again and again <laughs> until I come up with a color. So I'm just going to live with this. I'm just going to assume this is going to work. Although I, I think it's, I could be a little duller as we move down. So I'm just kind of mixing some of these dirtier browns that I already have on my palette back into that color. There we go. Keep it a little brighter at the top, a little darker as it goes down and get a little bit of a break up like right here. A little bit there, there. Oh, down there. to lighten a little over here, just so. Like... So I'm chopping away at him sometimes and re-adding him back in there. I just chopped away, now I'm re-adding. That's his coat. And that's his leg. That's his shoulder. If I can get it in there. There we go. It'll leave it alone. But I do want to take and clarify the foot a little bit if I can, right there. That and this foot's up. So slow down. Took my number. This is a number two. So it's much more of a control brush. It's a, where I can be a little bit more precise. Okay. And we want to make sure we get the reflection from that foot down and then it fuzzes over down a little bit further here and then back. Okay. So let's take right now, let's put a little striation in. I'm going to do a, let's, uh, before I do that, I'm going to do a few things over in here. Okay, I'm gonna put a little bit of clarification right here. And one back in here, a little bit that we see there. And these are kind of, you know, they're kind of gray colors that I'm using right now. Gray light colors. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Laurel uh, had a question. You don't do preliminary value studies for these demos, but you're fairly confident from experience. Do you ever do value studies for some paintings? Yes. I actually did it for a couple of these in the past. Um, yes, I do. Uh, occasionally, even color. Not not always, but occasionally, I'll even do a color study. 
uh, if I'm really exploring, I'm doing a series of portraits now uh, for myself that I'm not doing that in, and I probably should because I'm changing them as I go. But now I, a lot of times I just assume change the piece and keep some of the integrity of the what's wrong with it. Um, is that is that an oxymoron? Integrity of what's wrong with it. Uh, then I would uh, say, you know, when I illustrated, very often I'd have to do color comps. And you, in fact, in the film industry, almost always. Um, and a lot of times the character would come out better than in the finish because. Um, I was a little more daring. And in the finish, I was always more timid because of what art directors wanted. So with that in mind, I'm gonna do a couple of straight lines now. Um, but with that in mind, my straight line, huh? Pretty good. Um, well, I've got this color. With that in mind, I am. So I'm going to look at that angle right there. And there's kind of the angle that we're going to want for that first part. And then we're going to put another one in right about, let's see, I might even just freehand some of these. I'm just guessing now. Let's try it about here. Nope, it goes this way more. Okay. Now we're starting to get the perspective right. I'm doing, I, this is eyeballing everybody. Oh my God, Ted Young would be proud of me. Eyeballing based on knowledge. Does it feel right? Does it look right? Yeah, it's close enough, huh? Eventually, we're going to want to end up here. Okay, so we're going to want to end up with kind of that angle. So what you want to do is you want to get our spaces out. We want to go about here, 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 here. Okay, so let's do it. Let's go with that. I don't have a spot. The spot is out here as far as my... So I'm just eyeballing some of this stuff. That's a little too parallel. So you just wipe it out. And I'm throwing a little bit of medium in on this. Now I need to come in with some darks too, just so you all know. Ah, boy, is that, did I mess up on that one? Be easier if I did it this way, but I probably should have started at the top and gone down. This is where you start eyeballing. None of these, none of these uh, cobblestones are perfect anyway. So I always write it off to say, well, that's really how it looked. Let's see if I can do this. There we go. All right, I'm going to start eyeballing and just freehanding now, partly because of time. Okay, so now we're going to take, go back to this brush, we're going to add some lights in on the ground. You know, before I do, I'm going to do a little bit of Growing, show you what I mean. I'm gonna use this as a mall stick. My, my. Uh, yeah, you have the mall stick. Then. I know I have a mall stick, but I don't want to take time to find it. Now I'm gonna take that color and lighten it, and we're gonna put a couple of verticals and or horizontals in. 
I just took the same color and added some light to it. I don't want it quite as dark as that. And there's a couple down here, one right above. So we're gonna go right here and above it. Just anything we can do to add information, detail. Is it as I'm all sick? Do a little bit of drawing right here where this kind of comes out, comes up and over twirls around here, has a little, a lot of little filigree in here. And eventually comes all the way out. I'm, I've raised it, doesn't matter. I brought it up in front of that, even though it's not. And the other one is right, and it actually is kind of going down this way from right about here. This stuff really adds, but it's also the kind of stuff that I grabs me bits bananas. I'm just not that good at it. I know guys that are really good. They love doing this, but I want it to feel like it's part of the painting and not like uh, it's a rendering. So it's really, you wanna keep, a, there's a freshness that I'd like to keep to it and keep it painterly and not um, refined. And this one comes down about here. Okay, and then it's got a little white element there, there, and then lighter edge. So take almost the white with just a touch of maples, and we'll put a little ding. Whoop, didn't work. Let's try that. That's better. That's better. Put, put it here too, because I don't have time to. So. Kind of makes it feel like there's a light there all right now let's go back into the ground plane put some darks in we've got the lights in now we got to do a few little of these darker that's way too heavy-handed that's better i'm going to take my um liner yeah there's a good liner i need a smaller brush is why i haven't used one yet but we're going to need it. So and once we get all enough of that in there, you need to we need to pull from that point too dark. So we start to give the feeling of some, you just look to see where your darks are. You look up in here, if you see, for example, we see that this, which is, I don't have it dark enough. Where are we at? A little over five minutes left, huh? So I want to bring that up. Bring that down. Bring that down. Let it miss, hit, pick up again somewhere. I know what I needed to do, hang on. 
I just told you to hang on. <laughs> Have no idea why. Okay. Um, I'm gonna put a little bit, I think this might be too bright. Yeah, it is. So I'm gonna throw some, I wanna keep it in the warm side. A little brown, a little feeling of some of these loose tiles up here. We catch a little light here and there. I'm leaving a lot of stuff out. And I, not really on purpose, it's just a time thing. But when I've done, if, you know, I've mentioned this in the past, when I've done, if it looks complete, then it's basically successful. If it looks good, if it feels like it's a complete painting and it's done, then basically, you know, for lack of a better term, there is a, form of success it's it's working but it's got to feel that way and it's it's coming close is all i can tell you guys in my opinion um uh, it definitely needs a lot more work so i'm going to take white maples and a lot of medium because i need to get a lot brighter right here probably a little too bright so i'm going to use that and I'm just going to mix it into the paint that's there. Start to move it over, move it around with that same color because it's the bright color, it's the brightness. Go right back in here. Hate to use too many little tiny strokes. Get real tedious, but while I Every time I put a stroke down, I'm picking up paint and it it's, it's works for you. And we want that same light coming right down. Because if I look at the reflection, I see a light working its way right down here. So we're gonna come right and work it right as it comes down, right there, there. You want to get a little bit, don't only want to paint one direction. Uh, it's, it's okay a little off in some of the drawing and it kind of bothers me that I made some of these things that that messed up, but it's painting, not a photograph. Now that can be a, a truth or a cop-out. In this case, it's both. This is the kind of stuff you could spend a lot of time on, have fun, just keep going back and forth. And it is fun. I don't mean that facetiously. I mean, it really, if, if you put it in there and it's not working, take it out and do it again. It's the same old line that I use over and over again. Keep it if it's working, get rid of it if it's not. I mean, it's not rocket science. So one of the things that I've hopefully got today is giving you guys some great names of other artists to look at. Uh, just because I always think that's good. Uh, and it was part of part of my journey. <laughs> as, as was asked earlier, it really was looking at other artists, looking at great art, not trying to emulate it, just trying to figure out what is it that I like about it, that I, I wish mine had. 
And you know what? I don't know for a fact, because I we've never had the opportunity to talk with a lot of these artists <laughs> because they're deceased. Uh, but it would be very interesting to find out what inspired them. Um, I would love to know more about that. I mean, if we know from their writings that there were a few strong influences of I mean, that a lot of them had. Um, and I do believe that everybody's got those kind of strong influences. So what I'm looking at is above to see if I see it down. And I do see some, like it's, I can come down in here and put a vertical somewhere. I can come down in here and put a little bit of a vertical. And we get a little bit of a light right there and a little bit of a light right there. We're reflecting. So this is gonna reflect down too. So you can put a vertical in and then mess it up. Put that vertical in and then mess it up. And it'll feel like things are reflecting. I did the same with the darks. You can do the same with the lights. This, we can have some cooler, uh, I'm just about done you guys. So I'm gonna have to, that's way too light. So what do I do? I'm gonna clean my brush and push it right back into the paint. So it isn't as light as when I first put it down. Anyway, hopefully that gives you the uh, impression of what I was trying to do here. Uh, it's a lot going on. It's, I thought it was gonna be easier, <laughs> uh, which is par for the course, you know? So sometimes yeah. you, sometimes they tackle things and they go easier than I thought they're gonna be. And sometimes it's a little bit more, and there's just, because there's no light, um, I just assumed that things were gonna fall in place a lot faster, but there's a lot of, little subtleties that occur that if, if I had the time, I could probably get more into. Um, so I've got the look and the impression of what I was after. That's the main thing. I mean, in these, that's pretty much what you get. And pretty much as I've told all of you in the past, what I will probably do is put, I don't know, 10 to 15 minutes back into it, but I'll take a break first. And come back and look at it, see if there's 10 to 15 minutes worth of stuff that I want, want to, and there is, I can tell you right now, there's probably about three hours worth of stuff, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna turn it into that kind of painting. I'm gonna keep it as a nice uh, painterly uh, approach and be try and be satisfied with that, not make it like a finished painting. Um, a lot of times artists like these paintings better. Artists. Uh, I always say the public does. The public generally likes finished paintings. You, you do get some uh, individuals who love the totally super loose, unfinished kind of characteristic of a, of a plain air piece. But, and you know, for a long time, I never sold my plain air stuff and now I do. Anyway, you get the idea. I think that's about all I'm gonna get done in this amount of time right now. So hopefully uh, it, um, it looks okay on screen. I have absolutely no idea. I assume it's relatively successful, but in any event, that's it. So it's not a real colorful piece. I didn't want, that was not my intention. My intention was to give the character of rain. I could, real, I could spend, a little time in here, kind of like some of the unfinished qualities in here. I do, I actually appreciate it. This I know I could put more time into. Um, I think my figure's okay, I can't tell. I need to get away from it for a little bit and then come back and look. And I might wanna amplify the light of the umbrella and maybe a little bit of the structure of the umbrella, which I really didn't get into, you know, because the umbrellas will have ribbing, something like there, there. But let's not get into that, okay? Um, happy painting, everyone. See you next week.
Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Tim.